Now we got a very eclectic day going to happen today, and as I look around, trying to think of things that I want to do today, he goes, this is the last day we're going to have. Tomorrow the parts, are, some of the parts are due in, the lower and links are due in. In fact, Chris may drive down and hand deliver them, I don't know. If she does, I'd like to get the lower and links on that, get, get that part of it done while I have somebody here. We have a tire valve to put on here, and the only problem with today is it got really cold overnight. It got super cold. And what woke us up this morning, it's early this morning, they start chopping another tree down. And it, there isn't going to be any more trees left in Rutherford. And as I'm looking at all the children this morning, oh, I rub those noses up. Oh, wow. Listen to, I don't know if you can hear it. I'm going to poke my nose out there. They start chainsaws up at the, the break of dawn. This guy to cut the tree down must be becoming a billionaire, all the trees going down in Rutherford. Anyway, another bad thing happened last night. It's going to put, put a kink in our day. We had a little windstorm come by yesterday, and all of a bunch of crap in the pond. That eats up a half hour in the morning. And, but the good news is, tonight is Miles' concert, and we always look forward to that at night. A great little celebration for the kids. So before I even have my coffee, I'm trying to make some choices here. One of the choices I have is I can get the bike all set for putting the lowering links on today, sometime today. Hopefully it'll warm up this afternoon. Because i got to raise the back end up off the bike and I can pull the old links off. So you don't know on this, on an, R, on an R1, they go right in. The FZR is no problem. It looks like the bolts, maybe that muffler is going to have to come off. I don't know yet. Too, it's too cold to lay on the ground yet this morning till I have my coffee, but I would like to get that prepped up. And if I, could, if I did have extra time today, I'm not sure I will, I could pull the front wheel off, pull the tire off, and be ready uh, to put that valve in. So we have multiple things to do on Chris's bike. And I had some, that new buffing pad I wanted to test on something. I'll find something to, believe me, I'll find something to buff. It's never a problem. There's always something to buff. See, whenever a windstorm goes through, the few trees that are left in Rutherford, they all wind up in my pond, and that really gets to be a serious problem because once that stuff sinks to the bottom, it contaminates the pond. So I usually like to do that early in the morning, get that out of the way. And it seems like this time of year, sometimes you spend more time taking leaves out of the pond. Where do all these leaves come from? God, what a mess. And sometimes I have to do this two or three times a day when really the breeze is really blowing. I don't know if you can hear Treezilla in the background here. What a... They, we start out every day with this. Listen to chainsaws and... What the hell are they doing? Well, there's just no substitute for a nice hot cup of coffee. I and mean, I'll go take a nice ride somewhere. <laughs> Some more where it's warmer than it is out there today. And because the wind is blowing, I may have to do that pond cleaning thing a couple times today. Okay, boys, there's no fighting this morning. There's no fighting. We got plenty of seeds. Right, this is a good morning to have a cup of coffee and do some two-stroking. Oh, boy. Whoa, what a nice fall day this was. I remember this day. And after doing that pond, boy, oh boy, it would be so nice to be able to jump on a bike right now for an hour, but a little bit, a little bit too cold and the roads are still slippery. But we're trying to get everything ready so tomorrow we'll be, we can get some work done on Chris's bike. Should be good, there should be a good day tomorrow, you never know. Now after a great cup of coffee, a nice ride on a two-stroke. I'm still frozen to the bone after being out there by that pond. But anyway, today it'll be a little bit challenging getting a schedule going because Karen's got a lot of things she's got to do. I have to go to Home Depot for some material. And I've got several other things. I've been working with John on converting over some of this old footage. And I have to look on a computer yet to, today to see if it converted overnight. It takes a while to convert. We have these old flip videos. And one of the, mo one of the ones that I wanted to try to salvage some of or all of for memory shake is Ray Straub had a muffler on his SV650 and what happened it broke in half I don't remember if he crashed it or what but I made a video and of course then it's not the the repair that's important 
the nostalgic part of it. And maybe later this afternoon I'll work with John on that, but we have a new editing program we've been working with, and John's been so helpful helping me convert over the new computer to the new editing, and being able to capture these old videos that Ray sent up, and Luciano, by the way, said he has a whole bunch of those old DVDs too, so we're looking forward to that. I don't know if we'll get to do some of it this afternoon, tomorrow, or when, but it's definitely coming. But right now, I'm looking at the parts. That buffed out so nice. Wow. That, that's going to be the cherry on a Sunday on assembly day. Now, one of the things I wanted to do today is test this new pad, but I thought, good time to put on what I think is going to be some useful information. I, when you use one of these big buffers on motorcycles that are assembled or parts, it can be tiring on your arm. That, and because I'm a wimp, I prefer the smaller palm sander. But one of the things these have, and it's important to know how this works, they have removable pads. Notice this one says flits would mean the black is the softest, the least aggressive, so it takes, flits almost takes no material off. So the black are always the, the staple of what we do. But there's also some things that I think are worth showing. These are the pads that go in an ordinary electric drill. And they can be just, they're very soft to get in little angles and edges and things. These are very helpful. I wanted to show a couple of the things. Now, years ago, this is funny. I really shouldn't even show this. Years ago, I would buy a used motorcycle. Usually it was an, a Yamaha that had hit a telephone pole because the kid was doing a wheelie. And the first thing I'd do, I'd bring it home. I wouldn't even register. I'd get some DuPont white and DuPont red and grind a tank and do the fenders with chrome and get it all polished up. And this is what we use, these wool bonnets. Well, I don't like using these anymore. I have a bunch of them. What I like are these, I wanted to show them flits, of course. These are the staple things. But the, the pads, this is something to never use to try to buff something. It's way too high speed. It burns right through the paint. It's only good for doing little areas of chrome and underneath where you can't really get to it. I have not found that to be really useful at all. But I wanted to show this because there's a lot of people that are not really aware of how this works. And let me take some of these out because sometimes you don't realize there's something looking you right in the eye. I wanted to show this. And and you just don't get it. These these foam pads. Now, when Glenn was here with his buffing thing, it the, it was a, a, a system. It had the pads, the material, the wax, the compound. But I put my own system together. Now, this one I have just for cleaner wax. I write on the back of them. If they have nothing written, it means I use them to do the car or something. Uh, 4CR cleaner and polish. So... They had 80, 80, 65 only. They had different grits. You can see this one looked like it was used on aluminum or something. But these things, here's the, here's the thing is I don't have any of these. So at some point today, I want to try. These are a little more expensive. These are about half the price of, of this one, but they're both available in Harbor Freight. So I wanted to, I wanted at some point in the day, and it looks like because it's so cold out there, this would be a good thing to try first before we even go out to the garage. And Karen has a list a mile long of, uh, of I think we have to do a vegetable run today or whatever. So I'm going to set up the tool and see how this works. Now what I always try to do is I have a, all my heavy duty stuff that usually stays in the cellar. And I have a bucket, it's usually a laundry basket, that I take of things that normally wind up. Same, same products, I have a couple extra buffers, a couple extra drills, all of the pads, all of the waxes and stuff. Having one for the garage and one for the cellar just makes e works the work that I do a little bit easier that way. So because I haven't used one of these, I've I looked on the chart here and it shows that this is the the most ultra fine one. And I do remember, oh, it's very nice here. So what I I want to make sure I keep this and I'll mark it later. First, I'll see how it's going to work before I get too excited about it. And again, because it's from Harbor Freight, it's well, let's hope we get a good value for our money, and I think we will. I'll try to get this centered if possible. Not really critical if you don't, but looks like that fits right on there. We got our old reliable 8065. Now, the choice, second choice would be the Meguiar's very fine compound. And 
when I had it, they had some of that years ago. That worked pretty well. Now I'm going to just do the thing like the uh, ammo NYC people do. I want to see how this is going to be. Now what's good about this little test today, and we're always trying to test things to learn more. And if we learn something like we did yesterday about the aging of paint, of course the answer is we'd like to we'd like to be able to share it on YouTube. Now this part has already been buffed. It's the carbon fiber part we made that goes under the windshield. I want to set the, the buffer on speed 2. That always seems to be a good place to start. At, the problem with the big heavy buffer is, if, when you're doing little parts, you can see it gets awkward. It's like, but it does, when, an, when a motorcycle, or even better for a car, you do a whole car with this in less than an hour. But I want to see the quality of the buffer here. It won't take long to figure this out. Now you might be wondering that, well, that part's already been buffed out. Well, that's true, but not true. Because what I would do before I would assemble a motorcycle, I would want to put a coat of flitz on, so I would get another one of these, keep the one for flitz, just for flitz. And I want to see now with a, with a clean microfiber. Now this is a hard thing to show on because I'll, we don't have a real good macro lens. But no matter what you do, you can see tiny, tiny, tiny scratches as the light candles. And this looks like it really did a really good job of leaving no scratches at all. This looks really good, in fact. Now, maybe this is going to be worth doing uh, to, to the whole motorcycle, and I don't know. But, but again, that's why you do these experiments. Now, I like this, this pad so much, and it, it actually is a little bit easy to use because it has this angle. I'm going to stop at Harbor Freight probably later today or tomorrow, buy a couple more. Because I'll want one for flitz, one for wax. What? But the 8065 one. Now, this is old paint. Now, the paint going on three or four months old. It's been buffed, yes. But it always has just a little bit nicer shine if you can... How, it's hard to explain. To make it easy to explain, it's it's the, the size of the grit that determines the shine because the size of the grit leaves the scratches that you don't see with the naked eye, but it leaves that gloss. An example, if you sand, if you sand something with 2,000 grit, you can see the scratches. 3,000 grit, ooh, the scratches, you know, the, the thing just looks foggy. When you get into the compounding area, and this one shows what area this is. This is, uh, this is 3,000 to start. So what happens is, Flitz is 6,000, by the way. When you combine the, the grit from the pad and the grit from this, you got a combination of these two that are doing the polishing. And the objective is to leave as few scratches as possible. So from the sanding to this to the final thing, just before we're going to assemble a motorcycle, I want to have it absolutely just just perfect and then put that last coat of flitz on. But this is going to allow me now one more choice. It's one more tool in my toolbox for buffing. And this, I've, of course, now the one thing you never want to do, you don't want to take this and put a DuPont red rubbing compound on it. Because the finish that you're going to get is always from the roughest grit stuff you have on here. So if you were to put, now this is, let's see what this is, this is 30, 3,500. If you put, if you put something that's 2,500 on here, some grit, or toothpaste, toothpaste is probably, uh, who knows, depending on what brand it is, but it'll always go to the roughest denominator. So think of it like this, if you have a can of white paint and a can of black paint, and you mix them, it's always going to be one drop of black and a white, it's going to screw up the whole thing. One drop of white and a black, eh, I don't know if that makes a good analogy. Anyway, this actually, I can see that this does leave a beautiful shine. Now the only thing is I don't like, let me just do this for one second.
Now, among my modeling friends over the periods that I was heavily involved in modeling, the, the biggest single thing that was hard to teach people was how to buff out paint because it was it's an art, not a science. And it goes on and on and there's constant new development of how things work. And now here I have a side that isn't, yeah, I can see, I'm sure some people can't, but I can see the difference between that. I don't know if you can, but that's certainly, and I don't know, our macro lens doesn't really do a good job anyway. But maybe the next thing I ought to invest in is a good macro lens camera. But what's nice is if you have a basic understanding of how to buff things out, the rest follows through. But it's the, the, the grit, think of it like sandpaper, that the, a perfectly buffed surface, a diamond, would have no scratches. That's the thing we're striving for, is to have, when you look even under a microscope, that you don't see scratches. And I think this is going to be, as I said before, I'm real happy the way this played out. I'm going to, next time I'm at home, I may be at home for eight this afternoon. I'm going to get three or four more of these. They were about 10 bucks each, I, I think, I'm not sure. But I'll get all soft ones because I'm always trying to get that really high quality shine. But anyway, not sure if any of this information is worth knowing. I know my modeling friends, this is good information because this is stuff you can use right away. So what happened, and I did it off camera, I ran a couple of these parts. It worked really good on the windshields. I ran them on just to see how that would work. On the fork legs, it's real nice because that pad shape gets in the little grits that are hard to get in. There's, this is going to be a, well, that pad might make the job a whole lot easier. And I'm just thinking of, see, on a shape like this where you can't get in there with the regular buffer is too thick. That foam pad gets in there. There's a lot of things in some of these scoop areas. So that Bauer pad, that's going to be part of our toolbox. But right now, Karen has her heart set on. <laughs> we got to go buy some more vegetables. And John asked me the other day, am I a total vegetable, a total vegan? Well, the answer is, look at this. You can see the wheels are reflecting in the tank. How cool. I'm not a vegan yet, but <clears throat> that's the direction we're going in. So we're off to buy vegetables and take the beautiful wife out for lunch. So the Bauer pad looks like it's going to be a, a good one. And I don't know if we're going to get up around that area today, but if we do, I'm going to get a couple more. First stop, as always, is our wonderful Home Depot. I don't, I don't think I ever go more than three days in a row without going to Home Depot or to the vegetable store. Let's be honest, what could be more fun? So the way this works is, if I buy all these vegetables today and I eat all my vegetables, then I get the, the great honor of taking the lovely Mrs. Ertnowski out for lunch. Lucky me. Lucky her. Now even Luciano shops in Aldi. What a great store. How can you have more fun than this? Come on. And what could be better? Then lunch with the bride. There may not be much time left when we're done. This turned out to be a good day though. Well, unfortunately we really got back later than I thought and we got to get ready for two things. Miles has his concert tonight and it's still too cold out in that garage. Even though it's bright and sunny, but it's still really cold. I declare time for a coffee break. Oh, all these errands, what a day. So I wanted to mention something that, uh, and I want to thank Ray again for finding these, getting them, shipping them for me. Uh, what we found out in trying to recover this, I call it flip footage, it was all shot with a flip camera from eight, ten years ago, maybe even a little longer. We do have some stuff that, that transferred over with John Pothier's help, we got some of it. Some of it didn't come out, it was so grainy it was not even worth looking at. But some of, the, some of the stuff did come out pretty good. And I'm going to go through some of these. I have some of them already out on the computer. John has loaded up 
two programs for converting these over and it's it's a hit or a miss thing because I don't know the quality these were recorded a lot of them were recorded originally and then put on VHS tapes which were then in third generation put on discs so to be honest I don't even remember but anyway there was some priceless stuff the sport bike footage stuff I know there's some other priceless stuff on here and when I, I just reviewed it real quick and just just looked at it, one of the things that's funny is how young I was 10 years ago. And I realized, yeah, well, yeah, it was 10 years ago. And I looked, wow, if only we could make that a permanent thing. Anyway, I'm going to see what I can come up with. I got a little bit of time before we have to go to the concert. And I know several people have said they really do enjoy this old footage. So we'll look at a little bit of it, see what we can come up with. And tomorrow is the big day. Chris is supposed to come down with the lower and links and the other the parts for that project. So it'll be good to, and it's really cold out there. That's another thing. So I hope you enjoy this old footage. It's nostalgic to me. It's a little bit of a, uh, a, a record of the life that we've had. And in, in this case, the life that we've shared with you. And we're here for Miles's recital, third grade recital. Karen's already down there with our reserved priority seating. So the way this worked, we got back from this really nice concert that we had and no, it was fun and I had a little bit of time left at the end of the day I went projects. through this is the, the some of the Ray the videos that Ray sent and this is just one piece Boy, of, of time at something track, I'm sure some people out ago, there uh, would find this very uh, very boring this, this, but it, it, it was a repair and I had repaired this muffler for Ray using carbon fiber and what had happened is it worked it looks butchery now that I look back at this tape year old footage and I thought, it looked like so it, it would never be fixed it looked like a butcher job and then i realized i it's all it runs over the part of seven or eight discs that it's all in pieces but i found this is the original piece of doing the repair i thought it would be an interesting thing it's very very high tech to do this this is not something every you know like like they always say don't try this at home but i really think if, as i look back at it the cool thing is there's a lot of things if you can tough out looking at the next it runs about a That's half an hour, goes. this footage that I found. A There's a couple of really there. things that right I now, thought just need to get that blew my mind. First off, I'm in my old shop. This is the same physical thing. building, See, to do, right, the shop right, that I had, but it, it's, it's set up to build model airplanes, not really for motorcycles. Gonna change so, the diameter now, I'm going to find the second half of this repair, so because believe it or not, I'm this came out looking like a brand new muffler. And I think, right I, I'm pretty sure Ray is still using it. It worked you. perfectly, oh, we'll but it really so, looks like a lot of work. Now, this is using this, Huntsman high-tech resin, some very... I, I did this for a living, so I know this is not something you want to do in your own house. So really have but another thing that blew me away, somewhere later in this video, and I'll stop talking in a minute, somewhere later in the video you'll hear a bird chirping. And the first that was my pet Baltimore job, Oriole that lived in a house park. in my shop, not in a cage, flew onto my shoulder all day long. And he, he has his own dedicated video out on our channel of 17, 1800 videos now coming up on 1800 but anyway you'll hear a bird chirping in the background that's tricky anybody that's been to the shop knows it's tricky now i didn't want to get too far without thanking dave mitchell and dick hewitt both of whom provided material for this project this is really now what's funny is that this is 10 years old and i look back at just how things have changed in my life in 10 years and I actually, on the end of this video, I don't have room to put it today, but I will put it soon. I have 
the side. It's really, Karen and I were growing corn on the side of the house, and I forgot we had a big giant a garden here. We were growing corn. It just seems funny. Anyway, instead of me talking, I'm going to put this footage, but it's only a piece of, it's probably, there's probably a hundred times more footage of unique projects that we did in the shop like this. And so rather than talk over my own voice, which I know I'm doing, I'm just going to abandon hope here and hope that you enjoy looking at this. Now, the rest of this video comprises working, repairing this muffler. I didn't get it all because it runs over the course of several videos, but I'll get the end part of this. And when you see the end part, the muffler looks brand new. It absolutely, I used aluminum insulating tape to make a bridge. It's really a lot more high tech than you think it is. And micro balloons and various other things that, because we were making, we were making carbon fiber exhaust systems during this time for motorcycles and carbon fiber props. So you can see the shirt I'm wearing and all carbon fiber dust on it. Well, yeah, the, the whole my whole world was carbon fiber back then. So anyway, um, I hope you enjoy watching this. I tried to make it interesting, but to, to be honest, if you can sit through a half hour of this. And I really can't figure yeah, another way. It of may doing be interesting. I don't know. Really can't I, take I'll know when I get the feedback for this video. Really don't but have as one of the things I found on this have, video, I didn't have room to put it on. Maybe in the next couple days. I when I had the original R1, and I have the footage of. I'll bet anyway. it isn't a week after I bought it. It no, doesn't even have the stickers taken off yet. I, I know See, I that'll be in the next week. I'll edit that all down. Fill, I want to thank John Pothia for helping me, something. Ray for shipping the tapes, but this and Dave, Dave Midgley, too. and Dick Hewitt, of course, and everybody that and contributed to our technology to back well. then. We this, is, this is this was shot before we ever put videos on YouTube. This. So and this was a video I made just to show Ray the work that I did on his muffler. It's not really edited properly, but but I think you'll find it interesting. And you'll, you may even this. find it a little bit so nostalgic. This and this is what my shop looked like. At the end of this, it shows my it. shop 10 years ago. And a lot of times doing it's these really, kind of repairs, it's great. Motorcycle parts, and Ray, really I want to thank you again. This really, really made my day. Anyway, look at the rest of this. If you don't enjoy it, shut the video off now. And uh, we'll try to find the second half of this and put it on in the near future. So again, watch the rest of this. And... <laughs> the concert was great today. And the canisters. And tomorrow we got to freeze our behinds off out in that garage me. working on Chris's bike. And get Dora to help us so again, thanks for watching. Over the winter. And that's this is the part. See, so you know what I don't want to have is that this this loses its integrity while I'm doing this. And since we haven't done one of these yet, this is not like the Ducati part where we had no holes to fill. This is this is strictly a uh, well, improvise as we go repair. Much like the Suzuki, the 1100 was a, a figure it out as you go along job. But what this does, this just lets the carbon fibers bridge this gap. It's just acting like a bridge. And this may work okay, and if it doesn't, we just grind the old stuff off. And this will certainly be a better choice than just having that hole there. I'll have to ask Gray if this is from a crash or from a uh, just just wore out. Okay, we got one more here. Actually, we got two. But again, what I what what I find challenging about these kind of repairs is the material that we use on the model airplane exhaust. That resin seems to be holding up. This is well over a year on the Suzuki, and I don't think this part gets any hotter than an 1100 Suzuki. I'm not sure about the R1. I haven't I haven't done a temperature test on with the digital thermometer. I don't know what those those canisters get because they're under the seat, so they're probably prone to get just a little bit hotter than this one is totally exposed to the air. This should stay cooler. 
but they haven't melted on a Suzuki, so. And actually, when we're done with this job, we're going to have tied up probably uh, just, just basically uh, the cost of the carbon material, which I'm sure is a lot less than if you went out on the internet and bought a brand new exhaust system from uh, Yoshimura or Agropovic or whatever. Ooh, that's cracked on the bottom, too. I didn't even notice that. Shame on me, but I don't need to bridge that. See, a crack is fine. The, 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 uh, the carbon will bridge that. Now, I think that'll be a ton better than if we didn't bridge those gaps. So that's actually the first part of this repair now. Now i got to cut the material. i got to go over there and see what layer of carbon I'm going to put. I want to put a base one that probably will get just sanded. Most of it will get sanded down for the final layer. Now this, this first base layer, I think we can use, this is six ounce, no, it's four ounce, I'm sorry. And we can uh, make a pattern up here, I hope, that's, you know, we're at the end of our six ounce here. Ooh. Now making this pattern up will be a little tricky because I want it to go around. Let's get this. Special scissors, we can figure out the length. Now this is special stuff that we got from, from Dick Hewitt that's made the purpose of this material. It's only half carbon, but it's made with an, uh, it's got an aluminum impregnated counterweave and the purpose of that aluminum counterweave is to absorb heat on the part that, in other words, if you're making a, a, a shell that's gonna actually contact the exhaust heat. We're not dealing with that. We're gonna we're gonna use that for insulation. But even so, this just gives us a little more security, knowing that that's gonna be able to be the way that is. And that material, before you put the resin on, looks silvery and black. It at it actually it looks like it's e-glass, but it's not. It's a different kind of material. Now I got to get rid of the edge. Try to get some kind of a decent edge on this. The, the Kevlar edge keeps it from coming apart, but it, it also, when you're trying to cut a pattern, which is what we're trying to do here, makes it annoying. I put the joint in the back. The joint's gonna wind up in the back. Not really, you gotta shorten it joint's going to be on the bottom. So what that means is difficult to figure this out when it's a one-shot thing. Like all prototyping, it's a nuisance to figure it out the first time. You know, what, there we go. Now, now, now we're all set. Now that'll help us in the final layup that we're not going to see that joint. Even on this part, it'll be less sanding. Now this resin, of course, is very toxic, so I have to have the fans going. That's that noisy here in the background. And you don't want to get one drop of this on your skin. This is, this is... They actually don't even sell it to the public. That's, <laughs> I guess I'm not the public when, when it comes down to it. I'm not sure. Anyway, we're going to give this our best shot. I've been thinking of a, some other way to do this, but I really can't think of it other than to build this first layer up and try to straighten it out. Now, we, always, we have about a 20 to 25 minute window where we could work with this resin, and then it's going to go off and catch fire. And if that happens on camera, it'll be exciting. We usually are pretty quick. But anytime we mix this much resin and it's just sitting here in a cup on a hot day, it really is a fire hazard, so I'm going to kind of have to look at this out of the back of my mind. And what we want to do, this is the back, make sure I'm doing the back, make sure everything's mixed up pretty good. I'm going to paint the whole, whole exhaust system now with this resin. Now, for any of my customers or friends that get to see this video and they don't know. Ray Straub, we've had him on his subscriber videos. He sent us pictures from 
I think from Deals Gap, his brother Frank is a good friend of mine. We've done a lot of riding. We actually worked together at Ford Motor Company. Uh, a couple of my friends years ago moved to Florida for the obvious reasons. Let me go get the phone. This is what I hate, these interruptions. Uh, another call from a satisfied Ducati rider. Actually, the Ducati ones are easy to, easier to make than this one because they generally don't burn out. But when you think of what these things cost, I, I, they are getting more expensive every year too, which, which makes my business even better. Let's hope they go to five grand each. We can do these for a lot less than $5,000. And part of what happens with these is when you don't repack them often enough, the packing that you don't do lets heat get right out to the carbon. And on the, the real high quality ones, they have special material like this material that's aluminum impregnated. The real cheesy ones, the ones they sell at like aftermarket ones, that you buy at Pep Boys or whatever. They uh, they tend to just use cheaper brand materials that, again, we've done a few of them different ways too. And actually, if I know Ray's bike, I gotta find out if his bike is blue. I have some of that material that's blue, carbon fiber and blue that we bought for the R1, but the blue didn't match. It's just, just not the right shade of blue, but we do have some of that left. Now the trick here is everything's got to be saturated. This cannot be, we cannot have any, any part of this unsaturated. But so far it looks like it's going to be okay. And the only problem you have is if you do have a problem in the middle of this, and the resin starts to go off in a pot and you gotta run outside and throw it across the wall or something. And that's happened on video many times already. Anybody that's watched any of the thousand plus windy videos knows how how that resin can go. Oh, five, bl five blade prop mold, I ought to dig that video out. I actually caught the refrigerator on fire. We put the mold in the refrigerator and it caught fire. So that must have really been kicking off. That was nasty stuff. What I had to figure out how to do is I put a stick in it, in the vise, because I want to take a roll of tow and spiral wind as much of this as possible, especially on the ends. That'll just build up some carbon so when we block sand that in, it'll make for a nicer joint. So what we have is a roll of carbon fiber tow, which is used in the aircraft industry. This is real high-tech stuff. Now we want to see which way the joint is going. It's going this way, so we want to turn it counterclockwise. So the idea of this is to get an end on it that first of all won't fail in service And this is material you would be pretty easy. You could tow a car with this if you wanted to. The problem is we're going the wrong way. I got I got it backwards. Ugh. Okay, so we got it backwards. We want to go. Want to go this way. Okay, I'll just stack that up there. Put the new layer of resin. I'm gonna make sure there's plenty of resin underneath here. But what I'll do is I'll copy Ray on a, uh, just for fun, when I send him this pipe. And I hope he'll take a picture of it, and once it's back on the bike, and a picture of him leaning down with his knee pads down, touching the ground, making sparks, or whatever. Ray and I had so much fun years ago. He actually was responsible for uh, a joke that we still, we still use regularly in the shop called Senior Bulto. I had gotten a Boltaco motorcycle from somebody, I don't even remember who, and we couldn't get parts and Kenny Augustine helped us. Maybe I'll send Kenny a copy of this video too. 
and uh, he named me Senior Bolto Recommends. Senior Bolto Recommends. Make your carbon fiber pipes so they last. Okay, so now we got that on there. Actually, that doesn't look like it's going to work bad. Maybe I can use this on Ducatis too if, if I'm cute. For some reason, the Ducati ones really. Most guys that have a Ducati, they just go buy new pipes, but you could fix them, as we all know. It's a lot easier to do this, for sure, than that seat that I made for the R1. That seat was a bear of a job. And this is going to be fine up here. This will work fine. Oh, yeah. Oh, if we only kept better, better track of our tools. Okay, so one end of this now is secure. That's going to be fine. Actually, that's going to be better than I thought it was. See, they make material like the giant tune pipes. We could have bought some of that material for about six hundred dollars, but. I don't think Ray wanted, knowing Ray, he didn't want to spend any money. <laughs> He's like me. He's a member of the, if you can get it for free, get it. Anyway, we'll, uh, we'll laugh about this when this pipe is back on the bike. Okay, now what I gotta do is, one end's done, which is pretty good. See if we can get it right the first time. Now the angle will be different on this one. This is gonna be, I gotta work fast. Time is time is killing me here. Hope you get to see this. This has turned out to be quite a project. Interesting. And my intention is for the R1 is I really do want to make my own mufflers from scratch. I have a design that similar to what we do with the model planes for the material and. Now the resin is, is typically good once it's post cured in an oven. Seven days later it's good for 500 degree service. The problem is it's not good for 501 degree service. So if it's, and this is going to Florida, Spring Lake, Florida, if, if they happen to have a 100 degree day and that exhaust gets overheated, I'm not sure because I haven't had a day like that with the Suzuki yet. And even though I ride it is what I think is hard, it's probably not as hard as Ray is going to ride this poor bike because this is a smaller engine. Smaller engines have to work harder and typically get hotter in the process of doing that. In fact, I don't think the R1 ever gets hot. I don't, I don't think it's ever even overheated yet. Gotten gotten to where where it's been an issue. That engine never seems like it's even working. Okay. And once all this is on, then I've got what I call babysitting. Babysitting means I have to stay in this room and rotisserize this. Of course, I could, if I was doing enough of these, I'd make a rotisserie. But a rotisserie would mean that as this material starts to all drip and drool to one side, I do that. And then I kind of, I kind of baby it. Baby it, keep it flowing the way you keep any epoxy flowing. Keep it flowing. A lot of hand labor goes into this phase. It's going to be about 45 minutes or an hour. I don't want to, just want to burn up an hour of tape here, but I'm going to basically have to do this. Wait about five minutes, in which case, once it starts to get tacky, then I can hit it with heat. I'll bring in the heat gun and get it hot. And as soon as it, it goes to its first state of jello, first state is mayonnaise, they call it mayonnaise in epoxy world. It goes to mayonnaise, you can't touch it anymore because it doesn't, you can't move it, it's, it's stable. Once it goes to mayonnaise, you've got about a 15 minute window, then it goes to jello, which is the next phase. Now this I've got to get off of here. There's a big glop there.
And these are threads that have just come out of the end cut. I didn't get the end cut perfect, which we'll try to do on the final part that you see, since this we're not going to see. And actually, even if you see it, it's going to be in the back of the, back of the part anyway. But I thought it would be interesting, and I hope anybody that sees this and can come up with, uh, we developed this technology for, the exact technology, in fact, for model airplane exhaust. We've made helicopter exhausts. We've made, oh, God knows how many motorcycle parts. But again, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be in our database now, whether the smaller motorcycles that may or may not get hotter, if this is an appropriate resin to use, again the resin is is rated for 500 degrees. The only way you can buy this resin is in five gallon buckets, and you have to have a a certificate that you've been trained in the use of it, which uh, unfortunately I don't have. Well, they don't sell it to you. Well, I get around that by buying it through a friend. Mr. Dave Midgley, who does have a license to do toxic work. And then, uh, what can I tell you? That's the life. Okay, now we're just going to go get the trowel and we'll do a little troweling on this while, while we're actually doing the babysit part of this. Now, another funny story is uh, Ray will probably remember. We had a Kawasaki Green Streak, a 125, that was really supposed to be a dirt bike. We turned it into a road racer, and and Ray said, "You better change the main jet before we road race. It's going to burn a hole in the piston." And I got all suited up and said, "Ah, what can Ray possibly know?" Pfft. Made a lap or two. I don't remember. And I I remember riding along at at 80 miles an hour. So I'm like, Eep! "Hole in the piston," which is very typical of two-stroke. Uh, well, is was I'm not. I'm not sure. Anyway, this part of it now, this is going to be, we've gotten a resin to just about turn the, its first state of, of jello, mayonnaise then jello, at which point we can scoop some of it off. And this drives down into, into the body any part of it that might be dry, might be needing some resin. And one of the problems with doing this kind of work is there's, there's the part of it that's the actual job, and then there's the part of it I call the babysitting part where you've got to just, you've got to just babysit it, really. That's the bottom line here. There's enough resin in there I can mix up some micro balloons and see if that's going to do anything that we want it to do. And this is a little bit trickier than it looks. To make, to make the material that we want to use for filler, we want to use the same material, of course. And this is the material. It's, I call it micro balloons. It's really colloidal silica. It makes for a nice filler paste. And when it's combined with high temperature resin, in theory, you should be able to do this. But of course, theory and this. Sometimes theory doesn't exactly work the way it should. So what we're going to try to do here, let's see if we can, uh, how should we do this? Let's do it with the brush. Another thing too, I have to kind of invent some of this as I go along. It doesn't jump out of the can for me. I wish it would. And this will allow us to get that shape back. We're still in the pot life of the material, so we can play. This has to dr now dry overnight, is the next step. It's a 24 hour dry cycle. It's got to dry at room temperature, this particular material anyway. Once this material dries, it needs to go into the post cure oven. Again, two hours, 212 degrees. We have a, a dedicated oven just for that out in the garage. And just like the R1 parts, all of them need to be post-cured. All these high-tech resins, Epon and this, have to be post-cured. 
they need to molecular cross-link and if you skip that step really nowhere near as good yeah uh, as I'm looking at this I'm to be honest I'm thinking this is going to be okay but I wasn't sure and the point is any work I do in model plane, motorcycle, or working on my house, whatever, I like to, I like to at least try to do the best I can. And I know one thing, you're not going to ride down a road and find another SV6 that's got the same exhaust, not, not when I'm done with this. Because I think what we'll put on the final, the final outside that you're going to see, we'll do it with herringbone so it'll look real nice. It'll be totally unique. And not one of your friends will have anything like it. They'll have those cheesy bought in the store commercial things. I'm always impressed too when I go back to Motorcycle Mall where I bought the R1. And I see even the, even the guy who's the head mechanic there. And they look at the bike and they go, where'd you get that? You made it? Wow. I mean, it's such a unique thing. To, I guess the chopper guy's... It's not that unusual in, a, in the world of choppers to make your own stuff, but seems like sport bike guys really don't make a lot of stuff themselves. So again, that's going to sit there in this part of the shop. Usually 24 hours does it in warm weather. In the winter, it usually takes two days for that to go off. Then the next step on this will be block sanding everything out. It'll be labor intensive. It'll be a couple hours to do that. And then we're going to try to put on that final coat of either herringbone or the blue carbon, redo the ends, and then through a, co through a course of several coats of finish, sand each coat, put another coat on, sand each coat, and try to develop a real nice finish on that. So that uh, this will give you many, many years of service, hopefully. Some of the choices of material we have for the outer thing, this is herringbone, which usually looks, this is what I used on the R1, is several threads go in one direction. We, of course, have this is aviation stuff that's very tight weave and even a little bit lighter. You'd never throw the scraps on any of this away. This stuff is over $100 a yard. So you really don't... This is a material called... A friend of mine, Bob Green, gets this. It's an aerospace material. It's not S-glass. Um, it, it, lo it looks like... It's, it's not E-glass. I mean, it's S-glass and a very tight weave. We've found good uses for that over the years. But anyway, since my friends in Florida and their kids have never seen my shop, this is my workshop. I've uh, been able to for the last 22 years. By the way, this is what the, the blue carbon fiber looks like. If you ever want to make some parts out of blue, this might not be good for a muffler because it's dyed. It may, it may deteriorate. I'm, maybe we'll just use the, uh, the weave on it. I do make carbon fiber fuel tanks for model planes, I make exhaust pipes, I make spinners, props, pretty much from the carbon fiber material. These are some of, but certainly not all of them, the model planes around the shop. And I've been able to, in this very, very small space, been able to eke out a living. This is going on 23 years. And this is my work vehicle at the brand new Sienna that I use to transport the planes back and forth from the competitions and for other things. And of interest, that, that dent in the bumper there is a, a car had 600 miles on it and we had a Harley go right into the back of it. He got the worst of it by far, but um, of course we're insured.